happy that now you understand just with my eyes that you're missing something and you're doing wrong your job, but it's okay. This is new for everyone. <laughs> Hello, beautiful people. My name was amazingly correct pronounced. Why, why the pagans laugh? Because I am easy but slow. And one year again here, elevating the rating of this conference. And um, you might remind, remember me by my series of querying spirituality, but and now we're done with that. The divine just told me it's okay. People will not understand much more than what you already share with them and illuminate them. So I said, why not querying the economy? That seems that it's something very, very um, like worrying to people around the world. So I, I, I look in my long list of friends and contacts and I realize, oh, Deborah Freeze, she's such an amazing, uh, successful person in all the realms around economy. So um, I asked her like, uh, could you come and join me? But I want you to hear from her own beautiful voice who Deborah Fries is and why she's so relevant for this topic. Welcome, my dear Deborah. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, darling. Which, how many times? How many I times? I am because there's a dog and the dog will probably, you know, share his presence during our time together. Thank you, YY, so much for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be in this network, but I, I have to say my heart was to spend time with the Pagan Slough, who I have not had the opportunity to be active with. I've just seen moments. And so I'm just so delighted that we get to be in conversation with each other. Um, though we also go way back. So um, for those of you who know Aaron and Yeo and Manish and Edgar and others, Mayan. Um, we were all part of the Burkhan Exchange Network together. Um, is it two decades? It's, oh my God, two decades ago. Two decades ago, right, Aaron? Two decades ago. Um, and that was a gathering of many of us who were, well, we Manish first phrased it and then I stole the phrase walking out and walking on, walking out of failing systems and walking on to build the new, which came out of Manish's work in India. But Meg Wheatley and I wrote a book with that title. So it's all been about how are people walking out of the ready-made world and walking on to create the world that we wish for. And after spending a lot of time in that community, I came home to Boston where I'm from because everybody in the global South was like, please, if you're from the belly of the beast, could you go back and do something about that? Um, and, and spent a lot of time on what does post-capitalist economy in community look like? Um, and particularly in community-based investing, which is a thing. So um, that then Yeo and I started to chat, Yay, YY and I started to chat about that. And here we are to share some of our explorations and inquiries with you. Thank you very much, Deborah. And people keep coming and coming. So Eileen, uh, my dear, Eileen, my dear, if you could uh, just share the, the prompt for the for people to introduce ah, yes. themselves in the chat. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, like so, why we want to queer life and the world because. Uh, we think uh, like straight way is boring and clearly at least in the economy world is not working. Like the, the way of doing things is definitely wrong people. So um, I was thinking, why don't we just change it all, make it different, find the otherwise for it. And, um, but then I was talking to Deborah and of course I wanted, I hear, I remember Bill Clinton saying like, is the economy stupid? And everybody talking about the economy. And I was say, saying, yeah, let's, let's change the economy. And Deborah like told me, no, dude, you cannot change the economy without understanding the role of money and without changing money. So could you please explain me, Deborah, what economy, what is economy? Because now I am all confused. Okay, so I want to, so and I didn't say you can't change the economy, but you can't totally transform, you really can't fully queer the economy or transform the economy if you don't 
queer money. You can you can make your efforts, right? But we'll we'll hopefully we'll explore why. And can I start with um a little bit of a story? Um, this is a quote from someone named Bernard Latier. I don't know if people have heard of Bernard, but he's from Bel. He was was he's not with us anymore, but he was from Belgium, and he actually um crafted the euro. He's the one who designed the euro and had feelings about that being a good idea and a bad idea and what went wrong. But he wrote a wonderful book called The Future of Money. And I'm going to read a little quote from him. And you might want to just close your eyes because it's an imagination. So here it is. Imagine a Martian landing in a poor neighborhood and seeing rundown communities, people sleeping in the streets, children without mentors or going hungry, trees and rivers dying from lack of care, ecological breakdown, and all of the other problems we face. He would also discover that we know exactly what to do about all these things. Finally, he would see that many people willing to work are either unemployed or use only part of their skills. He would see that many have jobs but are not doing the work they're passionate about and that they're all waiting for money. Imagine the Martian asking us to explain what that strange money thing is we seem to be waiting for. Could you tell him with a straight face that we are waiting for an agreement within a community to use something, really almost anything, as a medium of exchange and keep waiting? Our Martian might leave wondering whether there really is intelligent life on this planet. So I offer that because um, in there is the definition of money and it's sitting, it's nested inside economy. Um, so Yayo, I'm happy to answer your question about economy now, but did you want to say something about my Martian offering? Oh, it's a great idea, but I'm pretty sure that Martians didn't bring the money in and money was before capitalism, I'm sure. So it can be the problem. Why do we think that money is the problem? I love money. It can buy my wigs and my and all my outfits. But okay, let's go let's go back a little and, and define first for these people what economy is because they probably don't know me either, by the way, guys. Okay, so so we all know what economy is. Um but we're we and it it's hard, like the fish doesn't know what water is. Sometimes it's hard to say what water is because you're in it, right? So I just wanted to offer, um, and, and this is not correct. This is to give us some shared grounding, meaning there's lots of ways you could define it. But I just wanted to put up, oh, um, I'm going to start screen sharing and I'm getting a little message that says it will stop others' computer sound share, but that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, continue. So um, I'm going to just put it up here where you can see it. Um, just to keep things simple, simple-ish, right? Which is that the economy, first of all, it's a system. We know it's a system. Um, and I'm also trying to make sure so I can see you all while I do this. I don't want to lose you. There we go. Okay. So the economy is a system for deciding how resources are used. And so that goods and services can be produced and consumed. There's nothing in here that says extraction. There's nothing in here that says exploitation. There's nothing in here that's inherently good or bad. It is, I'm offering it as a neutral definition on which we can lay all kinds of things depending on how we design an economy or how an economy emerges. But um, neutral is is sort of the best the, a way I wanted to start. Wait a minute, we don't un understand because what he's described here is money. Like we use money to uh, to exchange goods and services and, that are produced and consumed. So why have this to do with the, the mess we are? In? Because you could have no money and have an economy, right? So we know barter economy. Right. So you could have a whole system of barter with no money in it, and you would have a whole and complete economy. So I wanted to separate economy before we got into money because 
money is something else. Oh, okay. So you have an economy like, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Like people that uh, doesn't have money and still eat and survive. I don't know how, but but that exists. Okay, enough for me. I am okay, so should we look at money? Yes, so let's look at money. We all love money. Okay, well, Bernard said it in his quote. It's just this. Money is an agreement within a community to use something really almost anything as a medium of exchange, right? So, so when we went from barter to money, and, and I'm going to show you in a moment a couple stages that got us there, um, it was like, oh, I, um, I grow a lot of uh, shiitake mushrooms here, and they're ready now. And um, yeah, yeah, what do you, you produce? Yeah, yeah, why, why, what do you produce? I produce love and happiness for the people. Uh, I have a service, uh, a service business that I cannot explain here because this is an old family kind of. Oh well, I, I'm, I'm I'd actually like but... to subscribe to that service business throughout the year and not have it only when I have my shiitake. So, um, if it would be okay, could we use something? Could we agree? um to store value so i have we have i have a chit i have a coin i have a shell i have a piece of paper i have something so that i can give you my mushrooms i get that object and then i get you for the rest of the year lucky you i understand and yeah i could see because i could i could agree with my neighbor like and by word and we don't need anything to exchange but sometimes i have people that come from all around the world and i don't know when i'm gonna see them again so i need something in my hand to retribute my money my time right okay so so far money is not a problem let let's look at it so i'm gonna there's different kinds of money we started out with barter and i threw some times in there it's really actually hard to find out when these all came along because it depends on which historian was looking at what and what was defined as what. But I've given you a general, like there was barter. And then um, there were many, many different objects, feathers, et cetera. But cowrie shells actually became a worldwide, you, were in worldwide usage. Um, and then we got to metal coins. And this was like, you know, um, first, we needed to store value because we didn't exchange things at the same time or for the same value. So we needed this object. Then from cowrie shells, we went to metal. From metal, we went to gold. Gold got heavy to carry around. So I think in 7th century China, they started to do paper. Um, it didn't actually really become popular in Europe until the 1700s. But paper was a big shift. Um, and it's an interesting thing about this is it coincided with European colonialism. Um, so how are they going to travel and use money? And uh, this is where this is where extraction and exploitation starts to become truly systemized in the money system. We'll get into that. And I, for those of you who don't know, the, it's an interesting story about the first bond, which is um, not an IOU, not a um, but a but a a piece of debt on paper. The first bond was actually backed by enslaved human beings in the American colonies, right? That was the first time that there was ever um, a, a a type of loan that was papered, so to speak. Um, and then paper, we moved on to plastic. Um, and then digital, and then crypto, um, which is a subset of digital. And, and it's important to remember, these are all forms. Other than barter, they're identical. It, it's the object that is that we have the agreement around. And I say that- Wait a minute. Yeah. How could you say it's the same? Like- those Europeans, now, I, now I'm getting it, they took the gold and leave us the paper. So how paper and gold could be the same? Uh, that is not clear. Or uh, crypto or things. Similar. What makes them all the same? Because money is an agreement. And so if you and I agree 
to store value in gold and you and I agree to store value in paper, it's the same. It's different if we don't agree. So money is an I agreement. See. How money is used to destroy and, and, and exploit is different. So this is, so one of the things that I think is worth distinguishing okay. is that the problem isn't capital. Money isn't the problem. Money itself, it is, I'm gonna get to it. Money itself on this slide, money itself isn't the problem. Capitalism is the problem, right? And the kind of money that we have today, capital itself, money itself can be used, right? as a gift, as a tool of solidarity, as a means to, or it can be used as a means to uphold an unjust system. And capitalism is that system of extracting labor, land, resources, we, all of that. Um, money itself isn't the problem, but today's money is the problem. And it is the design of today's money. And I don't mean crypto, digital, plastic, paper, gold. I mean, today's dominant form of money which is this fiat-based interest-bearing currency, meaning fiat-based, the fiat is the nation state. Mexico issues the peso, the United States issues the US dollar. It's backed by the government. So when we say agreement, the agreement is we, the citizens of the United States, have an agreement with our government to use the US dollar, right? Fiat-based interest-bearing, meaning if I have $10 and if I get it from a bank and I deposit it in a bank, I'm gonna get interest 5% and it's gonna grow. And so the problem today is that fiat-based interest-bearing currency, which we need to queer, gives rise to a debt imperative and a growth imperative that is the problem. And that's, that's actually what I want us to explore um, but to do that, we're probably gonna to have to talk about how money gets created. Wait, 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 I, I got the solution now. If money is an agreement, the government create the money, why don't we just send them to the government? Look, darling, we all agree that we do just need to print more money and then we all have money and the problem is solved. It would is that be... the way to create a government? Yeah, that would be great, but that's not how money is created. So, didn't you just said the government, the state, national state, create the money? Right. So let's just ask them, put your printers to work harder. Okay. So just out of a show of hands, how many people think that the government creates money? Okay, great. So this group knows that the government is not the one that creates the money. So how, so how does money get created? Should we do that for a minute? Um, and again, I know many of you already, some of you may know all of this, some of this, you may know part of it, and some of you may know none of it, but it's to give us a baseline because we have to know what we're querying money from. So, um, okay, how does money get created? Money is created out of thin air by banks. Okay, so the government prints some money. That's true, that's the starting point. Government prints some money, they put some money out to the central bank. So the Central Bank of Mexico, the Central Bank of the United States. That central bank takes that money, right? And lends it back out to people. But it doesn't lend the amount that it receives out. It lends a lot more because of what's called fractional reserve banking, right? So so let's let's start with let's just, let's use the story that's on this slide because it starts with uh, someone named Alice. I didn't make this graphic, I stole it online. So forgive me, I would have made the names a little more international. But anyway, Alice goes to the bank and deposits $100,000 and the bank is like, great, thanks, I have your deposit. And then they go back out and they lend $90,000 and to Peter, okay. So when they lend money to Peter, it's not that they took Alice's 100,000 and they lent it to Peter. They created $90,000 out of thin air. There's $190,000 in the marketplace now. 100 that's is Alice's and 90,000 that the banks made up and they lent to Peter, who then goes out and buys something from Joe. 
for $90,000. And then Joe goes and deposits it in the bank, for, deposits his 90,000 and they lend out 81,000, which is 90%. So the bank has to hold 10% reserve and can lend out another 90%. They lend out 81,000. That person does a transaction. That person deposits the 81. And ultimately in this case, 100,000 turns into, whoops, not that slide, sorry. I wanna go back and I can't go back. Let's go here. Um, Bastardos, those bugs. What's that? Yeah, that's, <laughs> yes, Bastardos. Okay, so um, I'm not sharing anymore, am I? Mm -mm. Okay, let me just go back and we'll, we're almost done with this so we can get to the fun stuff. Um, so that, uh, that little story adds up to $271,000, but if you keep going, $100,000 turns into a million dollars. So the government created $100,000 and the banks created 900,000 more out of thin air. And that is the money that's in our economy. Does that make sense, YY? Yes, yes, yes. But why don't the bank, we just keep the banks the machine to print money and we print money, you know? Or we stop growing. Why do we have to pay interest for our, when we have to borrow a little from the bank? There will be so many ways to solve this. Right, because this is the other problem when the banks create money. They create enough money for, what do we say? We're lending 90,000 to Peter. They've created enough money, 90,000 for Peter to pay back his principal, his 90,000, but they charge him interest. Let's say 5% interest. They didn't create the money to pay back the interest. It doesn't exist in the money system. So the banks create enough money to pay back principal, but there's no money for the interest. And the only way that Peter can pay back his interest if, his, if he gets it from someone else. So either two options, think of it as like a game of musical chairs, right? Every round, there are enough chairs for all but one person. There's only enough money supply for a subset of everyone. It, there's not enough money in the money system for everyone. So someone's got to fall out of the game or the economy has to grow. And that creates- Wait, 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 wait. Be before you go to that. So you're telling me that it's on purpose designed that our debt is never being able to be paid because someone else will fall down of the game if we get that money out. Wow. It is so on that's why purpose you designed to be have someone fail and to have the economy grow to stay ahead of itself. So not okay, so fails. The, the growth part is what was going to save us then, isn't that? Like we yeah. could grow and grow and be more famous and beautiful. And we have grown and grown. So that's this, this other slide. And this is my last slide, people. And then we're going to get into a uh, conversation. We have grown and grown. So I just did the US dollars, right? So that teeny little green one is the $2.3 trillion um, of US dollars in circulation. That's the money that the government created. And these times don't, they don't compare exactly because I couldn't get all the data, but they're close enough. The 27 trillion, the blue, that is the value of the goods and services that we produce in the United States. So we said money is, an, uh, the economy is, uh, you know, how we resource goods and services, labor and natural resources to produce goods and services. That's the blue. But the brown is the value just um, of, Equities, U.S. company stock positions, and debt, that's $50.8 trillion, and debt, $51.3 trillion, the U.S. bond market, that's $102 trillion. That's the so-called value. Like if everybody called, turned their positions into cash, the economy would collapse. It's all speculation. That, that has nothing to do with money. It has to do with stories that we tell about value but the money system relies on this kind of growth and speculation. It has to keep growing and growing and growing. And we have hit that limit to growth. This is why, at least in the United States, where we have these crazy conversations about 
the debt ceiling, um, that things have grown and grown and grown. Here's a, here's a quote. The economy has reached its debt limit and is entering its insolvency phase. We are not in a cycle, but the end of an era. The old world of debt pyramiding to a fraudulent degree cannot be restored. That's economist Michael Hudson. So, so this got created. One, yeah. One more thing, because Erica Reyes here said that nobody had broken money like this and she's getting something. But what I don't understand, you said at the beginning that we use money to exchange services or products. What the fuck is that the, these people in the stock market service or product creating to get all the money back as, as their profit? The stock market has almost nothing to do with the production of goods and services, except for when a company first goes public, when a company first offers its stock to the market, they're being valued on their goods and services. After that, when they're on the market, People are speculating, they're trading. I think it's, I think Apple's gonna go down. You think it's gonna go up. And that creates this crazy pricing mechanism, but it has nothing to do with the values of the goods, the actual production of goods and services. It has to do with the story about the value that I think it's worth more and you think it's worth less. And that's what the market is, it's speculation. So they they have been making us live out of economy because we just define economy as the agreement that we do to exchange service or product. This is exactly why if we want to queer the economy and get it back to something that we believe in, we need to queer money. If we keep using fiat-based interest-bearing currency, it's it's very difficult. It's in the design. It's a design factor that makes it impossible to bring us back to local, sustainable, cooperative, self-organizing, living on the resources of one planet because the money system has the debt and the growth imperative in it. Oh, I see, I see that. Oh, because there, there's uh, some, some options to that. No, we just have to say we don't want to grow anymore, but then what will happen? Well, the good if news we is that growing. if we stop growing, then maybe we can actually survive <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> There's a chance. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry. Oh. If, 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 yes, if people would be harmed, this is like anything when we want to walk out of one system and walk onto another one. If you just, just, you know, killed off the current system overnight, a lot of people would be harmed, right? So, so when money crashes, there is harm and damage, which is why in the spirit of walking out and walking on, we want to explore querying money, walking on to create alternative monies so that we can build a system that is aligned with the way we think about being on a regenerative, being in a regenerative relationship with the planet and each other. Oh, I know, I know a story like that. There's a little experiment down here in the, like, it will be really cute indigenous village in Veracruz, right? And they have a university, very cool, an intercultural university. And they started with this experiment in the village where the, this is a tiny village, peasants, indigenous, you know, all indigenous people, very cute. And uh, they start using a, a coin, they, they, they call it Tumin. So the Tumin, it's, a, it's an alternative coin that you could mix with the regular peso money. So you go to the store, and if the owner of that store is smart enough and it's part of the network of the two mean that you, you get in for free, you sign up to be, you said, I produce or I offer this service or this product and you sign in and they give you a hundred two means at the beginning. And then you can give, receive part of your payment of your goods or services in regular money or Mexican pesos and the other one in two means. And the whole idea is that to try to keep that money in the local economy, because they, they realized that all the money was going to Coca-Cola and all those people that have their stocks in the stock market, and the money was not staying in the community. So the, 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 the whole purpose at the beginning is to keep the wealth in the community. But now they have been grown. There is running around 27 states of Mexico I sometimes buy some stuff from Chiapas here in Oaxaca and each member decide 
how much you will accept of the percent, how percentage of the price you will accept from zero to 10%. So the commitment is that you will accept at least 10% of the price in that. But what is really interesting to me, and that's what I bring in it here as a query of money example, is that what they tell you when you sign up is like, look, dude, what we're trying to do here is to change the mindset from in the exchange, in the transactions between people, from thinking, how could I profit from you? And instead we're thinking, how could I support you? And that's why oftenly, not only you can pay some of the products that are offering to me, part of it with to me, but often it's cheaper than if you just want to use the whole pen. So they do, and they uh, incentivate not create a, to, to, to hoard the money. No, they are always motivating people to keep it in circulation. And uh, they, there's this proposal, I don't know if it's gonna happen or no, that actually every year, uh, the, the money that is minted, that is issued every year for the Tumin system will decrease value uh, uh, with the years instead of gaining value. But yeah. uh, so is that a good example of querying money? It's a fantastic example. And there's, let me, let me break some of it down of what you just said, right? Because again, if you think about this from a system design standpoint, um, there are a number of things. First of all, it's community and place-based. It is not, you know, it has to operate within a community. Um, it has no, not only does it have an interest. So this is interesting, right? When you said people need to be incentivized to support each other instead of to keep. So when money has interest, the longer I hold it, the more it accrues value. So I have a reason to hoard. If my money doesn't accrue interest, if it just stays the same, I will spend it as I need it. And if it has what you just mentioned, YY, which is what's called a demurrage. A demurrage is for every day that I hold a dollar, tomorrow it's worth 99 cents and the next day 98. So just the opposite of interest. If I hold a dollar today and then it's worth a dollar and one cent and then two and then three and the, the longer I hold it, the more value. A demurrage is the longer I hold it, the less it has value. And so the system is designed to incent me to circulate it like a healthy ecosystem. Resources are meant to flow. Aaron, you wrote uh, money is like water or resource flow in your check-in. Like resources are meant to flow. And by the way, in nature, they're meant to flow to where they're needed most. So, so there are ways that we could design money based on natural ecosystems, which is the opposite of the way we have our money designed. And yes, demurrage, that's right, with two M's, I think, or two R's, I don't remember. Um, so, so another thing is um, that I understood, I had to, I was reading on the Tumen also, YY, and I, I saw that a Tumen note is equivalent to one peso, one US dollar, or one minute of work. Three different yeah. ways of creating value out of it. That's, in, and, and what oh. that does, yeah. And now one euro, because we have recently some people from Europe uh, signing up. The whole idea is that it's just a substitute of a part of the currency circulating locally. So what's amazing about that is it's not a monoculture. So again, I, I use a lot of biomimicry thinking when I think about system design. So if you have only one type of money pegged to one thing, you have a monoculture. Monocultures aren't resilient and adaptable. If your tumen can be used as a peso or a US dollar or a euro or a minute of work or another tumen, there's more relationship, there's more interdependence, there's more resilience, there's more self-organizing. There are more features that are like natural systems that make that currency healthier and more viable. So, and, and there's zero speculation in that currency. So it's a great example, and there are many like it. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have come into relationship with time banking, where you exchange based on hours with other currencies. I live near one called Berkshires that many people know. There's different ways to think about it. But in general, I like to think about each part, right? If it's fiat-based interest-bearing currency that's the problem, what's an alternative to fiat-based? How do we make agreements with each other? Is it at the community level? 
Is it our municipality? Is it within a community like Ecoversities? So how do we think about the place-based alternative to the nation state? What are the alternatives to interest bearing, right? So either no interest or a demurrage type of structure. What are other alternatives? Time-based, an object. How else could we queer money that gets us away from the debt imperative and the growth imperative? That's the inquiry. Well, that's good. I am sure some people here have some examples of alternative ways of exchange and, and alternative ways of money. There's a question from Erin in the, in the chat. And then after we try to address that question, we will make a little pause of two minutes for a pee break, and then Eileen is going to send us to breaker rooms. And but let's see what we could say about this. Uh, of there is, but there is then a lack of agreement about the value. How does that work? There's not a lack of agreement about the value. What the, the agreement is, one two men is equivalent to one of the whatever currency is circulating in that territory. Because the whole idea I feel, and Deborah could correct me this because she's the one that knows about this topic, is that restoring the, the original uh, um, purpose of money that was a token of, of exchange, no? So let's say that uh, if, if I'm only using the two min or the money to exchange for something else, then it doesn't matter if it's a peso, if it's a dollar, if it's an euro, because locally it will be only used to exchange the product I need and I don't have the amount of tomatoes that you want for your cow. And that's why we use money. So I, I think, I, I think Aaron, in the case of the fact that the two in itself is pegged to variable things is probably a problem for the scaling of two men. Meaning as an entry level, like let's get a lot of these alternative currencies need a doorway in. They need to be flexible and adaptable to get people. If you're trying to, you're trying to pull people out of a monoculture system that has us all. And I saw in some of your check-ins, I have, we have a lot of feelings about money, having access to it, lack of it, et cetera. It's very hard when there's no alternative. And so making the two men flexible is probably necessary but ultimately it does need to be, there does need to be agreement about value. And since the peso and the dollar are not the same. Now an hour is the same. An hour is the same. My va the value of me, my hour, the value of your hour, same. We can agree to that. Um, I know Bernard Latier before he passed was working on a basket of commodities and other natural goods that varied and that things could be pegged to. So you do have to have something that holds value that we agree around. And in early stages of these experiments, the more breadth we can offer, um, probably that's necessary for allowing it to start. That is a really good point, Erica. You're right, an hour isn't an hour. That was, that's very Boston, uh, or an hour is an hour. <laughs> But I think the idea, the idea of looking at um, that's that's an excellent point. In the spirit of trying to find some agreement that an hour of my time and an hour of your time are equally valued, whether I'm a hairdresser and you're a doctor, it doesn't matter. Um, but the value to us is quite different. Okay, yeah, yeah. Should we should we give them a chance to dive in? Why why should we give them a chance to dive in with each other? Absolutely, we're gonna do some breakout rooms for uh, I think I think twenty minutes, so we could have some time to come back and and share what's happening. I'm gonna share the prompts in the in in the chat, but it's basically we want it's gonna be four maybe three people per room because we're not that many, uh, and um, so the first thing we want all of you to share in your group. In around 15 minutes, divide yourself, organize, please. Men, don't use the 15 minutes for yourself. Allow other voices to be heard. Uh, and we are going to, then after you all share your experience with alternative money, or, or, or not at all, but uh, you would like to have one, uh, then spend the last five minutes collectively coming to an agreement 
that you're gonna share back here in the main room with the rest of the group. What is our room learning about what conditions need to be present to queer mode? Okay, so this is the, the two uh, tasks for the 20 minutes that you're gonna be all together. And then we're gonna we see you here back. Here it is in the chat, as I promised Erin, you could hold your horses. We are trying to do this on time and as fast as we can. But you know, there's always more time than life. So enjoy your life. Eileen, when you are ever ready, send us there. And as you go into the work, uh, breakout room, sorry, we don't have time for the pee break. Go and pee or get water or whatever you need. Okay, see you here in 20 minutes. Why, why can you write the questions out in the chat? I think the last Spanish speaking person just left the room. I, I can't hear you, unfortunately. Let me see if I can chat you. And Deborah, do you want to go into a room? I didn't know. I was, I was going to say to you, I didn't know if we were going into rooms. Should I go into a room? I think, yeah. Okay. Sure. I always Great. think it's rich. Yeah. Great. But uh, I turned on your invitation before. So I think it was room two. Uh, yeah, two would be great. Um, I think you don't need to be translating anymore, Andre, is my sense. Unless there, do you know someone? Can you chat me back? I can't hear you. I guess I could take you off interpretation. Is that what you need? Am I able to join myself? I don't know how. Deborah, not joined. Um, two, two. Um, um. Oh wait, I think I see. Oh, there we go. Oh, and now that's room one. Is that where you want me? No, room two. I tried to move you back. Did there you I go. Want... Okay, room two. <laughs> okay there's yeah in our in, is no she's not here anymore are they uh, I don't think there was anyone else there <laughs> okay Okay, thank you so much for translating. Uh, yeah, we have someone new, but Clement. Um, do you want to go into a room? I guess you can choose. Here, let me, I'll take you off translation so then you can actually manage language interpretation. And okay, I think Clement, welcome. Hey, Eileen. Right. <laughs> good, good to see you. Same, long time no see. Yeah, um, we're just in breakouts. We they just kind of started. Um, so would you like to get put into a room or just you know talking about money and how to use it and um, dynamics? How long are the breakouts? For probably another fifteen minutes. Sure, I'll okay. jump in. Great, I will put you in room number one. I just noticed there's like laundry and a dish in the back of my Zoom room. <laughs>
Hello. Alex and Gabby, I saw that you just joined. <laughs> Alex, I'm so glad you're joining the conference. <laughs> it's great to see you here. The bits that I can. I actually was going to be at a um, community justice partnership gathering tonight, but I ended up getting a little bit sick. And so mm. still participating in the world's cool amazingness from online is the ticket. It's good to have those options. Yeah. Who was hosting the the gathering in person? Um, this was the the Longmont Community Justice Partnership. Really awesome restorative justice oh. and community justice organization. Hmm. Cool. I'm gonna look them up. Longmont. Yeah, they're they're awesome. Longmont. I like that I um you know, we're doing this global thing, but also getting to learn about local happenings. Yeah, they have a really cool offering right now that's sort of launching around restorative approaches to parenting. And so bringing mm -hmm. sort of like holistic lessons that have been learned over the history of the restorative justice movement and applying it to what does that look like in terms of really like healthy and repairing um, like parenting habits and disciplinary practices and what what that looks like mm. um, in really a restorative way so it's it's a very cool offering that they have that's like i think it's five or six week series that they offer if there's like parenting groups or schools that are interested um, mm. really neat stuff can individuals join um i I know individuals can join once there's a group that's running. So right now they've got the curriculum built out and they're looking for partners to like be either hosts or interested groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, and just to say folks are in breakouts, so they're gonna come back in probably the next minute or two. Um, so Gabby, I'm not sure about the Wikimedia panel. I don't actually know that to be happening here, but maybe, do you know which room it's supposed to be in? You can answer in the chat if you'd like. Um, I sh I'm just thinking maybe I should close the room. Maybe I'll give them like a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so you're saying they are looking for like groups to host it through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else do to... they do? The lot... I'm just like on their website, Scope and. Yeah. Um, like a lot of it is working with folks who are in the justice system in some capacity. And so, folks who are either navigating charges or where there's been some form of harm. And they will work with both people who are impacted and people who are responsible and accountable for, for the harm and like work separately, talk separately, and then work towards like bringing that into like full repair in the same room, really powerful, really intense work, but beautifully done. Mm -hmm. um, one member of their team, Alejandro has been a, a friend for years through his um, community health work and outreach through um, the, the mental health world. And mm -hmm. um, he's branched into like um, bilingual case management with them. Really neat, really neat stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad to know that that exists. I'm sure there's a lot of need and it's always hard to connect with people. Yeah. yeah the genuine need to these services but you know um i'm guessing they're doing great work um right being towards that so i've um, been really hmm. grateful for weaving into the restorative justice community specifically for like being in touch with people who have skill sets around mediation within social justice yeah. work hmm. yeah um, but because there's like so many people who are hit by the frontline emotions of caring really deeply and wanting to make change 
And then yeah. there's people who want to have different strategies or people who are ideologically opposed and feel like an existential threat but might need to be collaborators. So yeah. much. No, yeah. there's a lot of heat. <laughs> I've been yes. using that word of like heat as like an accelerator. Last few seconds. <laughs> mm hmm Hmm. I'm hearing People like the, flooding in. <laughs> the half words of like try, you know, sentences that wanted to be finished. Um, yeah, but I'm hoping we can get a share out into this full room. Oh, um, I think not quite everyone's back yet. Let's see. Oh no, everyone is. Okay. Well, Bye -bye. everyone, but our, our hosts. Oh, there, there, there you are. Oh, <laughs> is here. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to for them to highlight us Deborah, because I don't want to look opacate the beauty of the rest of the people with my own. <laughs> but okay, here we are back. We want to hear. We're very interested in knowing what was the golden nugget, the takeout of each breakout room. Uh, and uh, I, unless there's someone else that needs translation, we could release our dear Andre for being yeah, in, the, in the channel. And I really big shout out, please people share your love to Andre. He's been awesome translating <laughs> so much these days and we're still gonna exploit him a lot for the rest of this conference because he's awesome. Thank you. Okay, guys, who wanna start? Who wanna share? What was, what are the conditions you could, your room could, could identify or dream about to queer money and economy. Nzinga. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I learned a lot in this little short time about the idea of queering money. Um, and what we learned in our circle, our session was some conditions that need to be set in place before or while we're trying to create the economy is definitely love and trust in this process that we're trying to navigate um, and more communication and sharing about this idea of querying the economy and querying money. What does that look like? Um, I'm learning so much from being in this session that it, it seems to me it's really important to share with more people what this concept is um, and especially young people. I mean, I'm 19. I didn't know this concept even existed. So it's really cool to hear about it. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's what we, the, the main takeaway was. Let's share more about this querying the economy and let's have love and trust in place as we start these systems and navigate these systems. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, dear Ntinga. So great to see you. I miss you. I miss you Someone too. else, <laughs> someone else that want to share from your room? And thank you, Mara, for for the for the taking the golden nuggets into the chat so we could remember them. So who wants to share? Well, I'll I'll just say we got lucky because we had Deborah, so we could keep asking her questions um, because there are a lot, and um, this is a whole course. I think what I walked away with what we seemed to come to was that the money system that we use that's evolved is wildly out of sync out of step out of tune with human systems or even living systems it's just out of context and it's and it's sort of become an you know have a life of its own the way it's grown and it has this sort of hungry need to grow to grow but now it's growing at at the expense of the systems it was designed to support that's what i walked away with thank you rob um Another room that I want to share, and then, um, oh, wait a minute, where is my people? Oh, there is Nate, Nathan, go. You have, they have Deborah, but you had me, honey, so I'm, I'm sure that you enjoy the time. Right, I got a few thoughts I can share. Um, I think one thing that came up was talking about the importance of uh, connection and relationship, and how do we cultivate that? Um, especially, I guess, uh, maybe in kind of, as opposed to maybe, but uh, transactions, transactional relationships. And so creating communities that can have relationships outside of money. Um, and that also there was a sense of uh, exploring kind of a scarcity or um, fear mindset that can, as opposed to generosity. And so that kind of spectrum. 
um, especially that can arise in more precarious circumstances. Uh, and I think out of that too, that we have gifts that are not just money. We have other gifts too that we need to hold into the light, not just financial assets and things, but we have a wealth of gifts outside of that. Um, that's what's coming to mind for me. Thank you. And I think there was still another group around there. Do you want to share? I, I can share. Um, yeah, I don't, we didn't, we didn't do very good at coming to uh, consensus, but we had a really interesting conversation around. <laughs> um, hi, Vishma. We had an interesting conversation around like being having Hello. to be in two systems at the same time and how challenging that is, you know, like, and so the thing, the first thing that came was kind of like, it feels like we need some kind of a sort of cushion or like an incubator, you know, where we can kind of get away from the daily grind, you know, because it's so hard to do this yeah. kind of thinking and querying when we're really stressed out and overwhelmed and you know it's it's tough out there and in here so that's one and then the other one we talked about a lot was agreements and like even though coming to good agreements at the beginning of some kind of an experiment isn't enough like that's what we kind of learned from the different stories that we heard um it's important right and then the last one that came up was like a com like conflict resolution stuff. Like how do we deal with conflict when around money or well, not necessarily money, but like mutual aid or, you know, we talked about time making, you know, there just needs to be, it feels like that needs to be a pl in place early um, because there are a lot of differences of, of opinion and experience. And there's a difference in, um, what we might experience is fair, right? That's one of the things that came up for us too. It was like some people might have a different idea of what's fair and how much somebody needs to be investing in terms of time or energy or whatever they're investing and what someone else might think. That never happens around our house, I promise. I like never think that I'm doing more than other people ever. Especially no. not, no, mm -hmm. never. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we all have the same ideas of value, right? <laughs> so easy to agree on hmm. yeah thank you guys um deborah how how could we left these people with some illumination and and uh and inspiration just could you share some of other takeaways that could come out from this conversation before we And you're mute. Okay. Um, I think we'd be over that by now. Um, what, so one thought to respond to and some suggestions. So, so one of the things is when we talk about money as an agreement. So if there's one thing you're walking away with, I hope it's like money is an agreement. And I'm in agreement with the agreement until I'm not. So, so I'm colluding in the agreement. Um, now, it's really hard not to, like unbearably hard not to, but I just want to name that we are collectively agreeing to this insane narrative and story that's built into this system. So, this, so, so um, and, and one thing that's important about it is the reason that we agree to it um, right now when we agree to fiat-based interest-bearing currency is the nation, the nation state is backing it. So the nation is saying, the government is saying, I'm the one that's, the buck stops with me, right? So I secure this dollar. Um, the reason people are interested in cryptocurrency, they call it a trustless currency because there's no one backing it. It's in the technology, the trust, it, there's no, central body that is saying the buck stops with me, it's a trustless currency. So we already have some tools for moving the locus of power from a central body to a distributed body. Now, cryptocurrency is completely capitalist. 
not all of it, some of them aren't, but most of them are still designed with the same debt imperative and growth imperative as everything else. So again, remember when I showed the slide, anything can be money. Um, it's how you design the system. So, so we have some options to rethink where we put our trust when we set the agreement in place and, and maybe technology can help us at, for a certain, yes, and b banks do insurance and then the government does and, and sets the value of it. Um, but also, Aaron, what you said about like, it's hard to be in two systems at the same time. Yeah. And the only way we're going to find our way out of this is moving beyond monoculture. We have to experiment in addition to one way of being with another way of being at the same time. So that we have, yeah, we probably will have the US dollar and other national currencies for a long time to come. And how much do we find our way into experiments with the Tumen or Berkshires or Ithaca hours or whatever else people are using? Um, and, and the last thing I'll say, none of that sounds too inspiring. It just sounds hard. So I'll say this, when I run into a system that's a mess and I wanna design a different system, the thing that I count on, like I shared earlier, is biomimicry. And so I'll just, I'm just going to put just, just a way of thinking, like when I go to, okay, how do I design something like nature does? And this one, this link is like, you know, cultivate cooperative relationships, incorporate diversity, embody resilience through variation, redundancy, and decentralization, self-organize. What does a money system look like? that uses biomimetic or regenerative principles in its design. It's, it's one of the things I was working on in Boston in finance is how do we use finance in a biomimetic way? And I'll just say, let me give you one quick example of what I mean. When people talk about interest and they're like, well, the market, you know, you're supposed to be small business. And so you got to charge that guy 15% or, you know, I got to get, I've got to get 10% back on my money or whatever it is. Living in Boston, we are, uh, an, a mature economic system. It's not an emerging economy. So let me go to an, a mature ecological system. A mature hardwood forest in New England grows naturally grows at a rate of three or four percent a year. So it doesn't mean there's no growth, right? There are ecological models for growth. So how do I design investing based on that? You know, or if like the oak tree, which is the tallest with the deepest roots sends its roots down and it gets the water that no one else can get and then takes that water and distributes it to all the other plants. So I was once sitting with the head of HSBNC, the big bank, and I was like, well, what if you were like an oak tree? You're the oak tree. Like, but instead of you reach, you reach all the water and all the sunlight, but instead of handing it out, you take it all. So, so how do we use how do we turn to nature to help us think through this problem? So it's not so overwhelming. It's like, oh, what does a self-organizing money, money system look like? What does a cooperative money system look like? That, that's where I go when I get stuck. So definitely nature is one of the, the biggest teachers of humanity. That is to go for iteration of this uh, gathering to to realize that and put it in the center. So I remind you all the topic of this year's uh, conference is how do we learn with and from nature? You know, so uh, I'm just uh, I, I've just pasted the uh, the the link here of the schedule so you can check for today i think it's over but uh normally the rest of the the, the days you will have uh some cafes to just go and chill and, and meet new people and uh, flirting with people around and, and sharing your takeaways and, and other little things that happen in the magic of this conference the one thing about the topic i want to add here is that whatever is um, missing in every modern society in economic crisis now that I know is a lack of community. You know? So it is not, um, it's not an easy thing to do, but I do feel that it's a requirement that we start trusting our kind and uh, not be afraid of the neighbor and uh, start by saying hi. And, um, 
I'm the way I try to live as much as I can in the gift, it is to really try to take transaction out of my relations as much as I can, you know? So what if instead of paying a babysitter, we have enough trust and love with our friends that we could ask them to take care of, of our kids when it's needed and what we could offer back. Uh, so there's always someone needing our gift and, and talents and we definitely need the gift and talents of others. So instead of fighting to see how I pay you enough so I don't have to deal with you, we start cultivating our relations with people and, and yeah, and exchange our gifts and talents. Okay, let's open the mic for a little bit because Eileen needs to go to sleep. She has to work early in this conference tomorrow. I fortunately, I'm, I am the start of one session, but I know that the, the yeah yoga, I have to come and work tomorrow too, and he will need the equipment. So uh, I open the mic if anybody wants to have a final comment with, uh, with us here. Share something. I just wanted to say thank you for holding the space. Um, I learned a lot. I have a lot of questions, which is good. Um, and I'm more curious about this idea and this concept. And I want to share it more with, with everybody I interact with. So thank you for sparking that in me. Ditto, thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Like I said, nobody ever, I never had an explanation like this. I feel like everyone should get, what is money? We all touch money, right? So thank you so much. It was really valuable. Thanks to everyone in my small group as well. This was really uh, fascinating. And Deborah, you really are terrific at presenting it so succinctly and clearly and accessibly. Um, we in the uh, Ecoversity's conflict composter circle have been talking about the conflicts that arise even in our loving um, gift economy and uh, uh, mutually supportive um, non-organization. <laughs> um, just how stressful it is to, to be working um, in a capitalist world and how even those of us who, you know, really go out of our way to uh, deliberately uh, buck that system uh, have to live in it and uh, and the conflicts that arise within our, our own selves when we are so anti-capitalist and yet we have to um, go through all these motions. It's a really conflicting thing inwardly and for any alliances. And we're hoping to start a series of conversations around that in 2025 20, when we start our new cycle and i'm just saying right now it would be sure great to have you involved in some of those if you'd be willing and thank you so much for this and and yy and you have done a terrific job